editing this makes me really want another cup of coffee. Let me show you how I make a kind of latte at home using a mocha pot and a handheld milk frother. I'm using scales just to give you an idea of how much water, coffee, and milk I personally use. Normally, I eyeball it, but if you've never used a mocha pot before, getting the water amount right can be tricky. Likewise, attempting to froth too much milk can get messy. The water in the bottom chamber shouldn't go past the safety valve. That's the maximum volume and what I'd use to make two coffees. Defining the minimum amount of water is more complicated. I don't have an exact answer, but I'd say it's about half of the available volume and what I'd use for one cup. To make my latte, I use one scoop of medium roast Swedish coffee and between 220 and 250 milliliters of whole milk. I'm using a stainless steel measuring cup because I don't have a microwave oven and I heat my milk up over the stove. If you do have a microwave oven, you can pour the milk right into the cup you want to drink from, leaving it about a third empty. Use the settings that are applicable to your microwave to get the milk to about 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit. If you want to use a plant-based alternative, I recommend using Oatly's Barista Edition. You want to bring the water to a boil gradually, so use medium heat. The mocha pot is heated on the stove, and the way it works is the water from the bottom chamber starts to heat up, creating steam. Once enough pressure has built up, the steam will push the water up through the funnel-shaped filter that houses the coffee grounds, emerging as coffee in the collection chamber, ready to be poured. Some of the water will remain in the bottom chamber. If you use too little, it won't be able to make its way up, and if you use too much, the collection chamber will overflow. I have the 6-cup induction version of the Bialetti Mocha Express. The cup size refers to a serving of espresso, and that's not a volume that I personally find useful. For me, this pot is the perfect size for one or two servings of coffee. That's why I say latte in air quotes. Realistically, the coffee I make is more like an Americano, and because I'm going to be pouring it into the milk and not the other way around, technically I'd be making a macchiato. At least that's how I was taught during my very short stint as a barista. So I guess you could call my coffee an Americchiato or a Macchiato Ricano. Whatever it is, it's still delicious and a lot more affordable than what you'd get at a cafe. If you're in North America and your usual go-to is Starbucks or Dunkin', try making coffee like this at home, and I bet you won't want to get their coffee again unless you're on the road and desperate, which, currently, you shouldn't be. Once you start to see steam and hear a gurgling noise, it's time to take the pot off the heat. I find the large, corded milk frothers a bit overpriced, gimmicky, and more difficult to clean compared to a basic handheld one. Mine is by Severin, and it probably costs around 7 euros and 90 cents. I don't recommend spending a lot more than that. I have, in the past, and what you're paying for is a nicer material on the handle, metal versus plastic. The functionality and design shortcomings remain the same. The weakest point of this type of device is its stem. If you bend it and it becomes deformed, it'll no longer work. It will just create bubbles that deflate immediately. That's what happened to my first and second one of these. I used to store the frother in a drawer with other kitchen utensils and sooner or later, regardless of how careful I was, it would get bent and become useless. I recommend storing the frother on a shelf in its box, at least partially, so the stem is protected. Oh, and make sure the button isn't being pressed on by the cardboard. I've been storing my frother like this for years without any issues. The only other thing I'd recommend when choosing a milk frother is to go for one with the power button on the side rather than the top. I find that to be a much more ergonomic and logical placement. I don't check the temperature of the milk and instead use the gentle steam as a sign that it's ready. The frother should be held at an angle and the spinning part should be just beneath the surface of the milk. This may take some practice in the beginning. I recommend doing this in the sink to minimize the risk of getting splatter all over yourself and your kitchen. To clean the frother, I just run it under some water and let it spin for a bit to get rid of the excess moisture.
To reduce bubbles, you can swirl the cup and give it a few gentle taps on the counter. While you can achieve a nice texture, the milk isn't going to be as creamy as what you get with professional machines that use steam. The top gets too foamy too fast, while the bottom stays liquid. That's why I don't pour the milk into the coffee. You don't get the same effect as with universally creamy milk. The still liquid milk would get poured in first, while the foamy milk would stick to the sides of the cup and need to be scooped out with a spoon. Frothing hot milk in a French press would make for even less creamy milk. Corded frothers and milk frothed in a fully automated machine yields much the same result at a much steeper price. So I just make the best of it and pour the coffee into the milk. Let me know if you try making coffee like this and if it inspires you to get rid of the Keurig or Nespresso. Thanks for watching.